So today I'll be sharing a bit with you about coffee, globalization, and gender. My name is Summer Lewis, and I'm the director of Truths International, and I'm also associate graduate faculty at Kansas State University. So to share a little bit about my background and why I'm talking about this today, I first became interested in the coffee value chain and fair trade as an undergraduate back in 2001. During my time as an undergrad, I became really interested in learning more about issues affecting small scale producers, especially women in countries apart from the United States. And so when I graduated in 2005 with my Bachelor of Arts degree, I decided to go out to save the world. And in order to do that, I believed that I needed to join an organization that was doing good work and that was making a difference. So I joined Equal Exchange the oldest and largest fair trade worker owned cooperative in the United States. And it was there that I came to learn more about the realities of trade, as well as the realities of fair trade, uh, learning firsthand in communities in Latin America, but also learning on the business side of things in the United States, working with consumers that were interested in supporting small scale producers. From there, I went on to realize that in order to continue to survive myself, I needed to go beyond my bachelor's degree and look at a master's. And so I was lucky to receive a full fellowship through the Rotary Foundation to study at the University of Queensland in Australia, a master's in peace and conflict resolution. And I focused my studies on international development, specifically the coffee value chain. So I was interested in seeing how do issues and inequalities within the coffee value chain relate to peace and conflict resolution. So specifically looking at issues like migration, poverty, and food security. And it was following my master's degree, graduating in 2012, that I went on to work for an organization called Coffee Kids. And I was based in Oaxaca, Mexico. And that's where I've been since 2013. In 2015, my former boss and I decided to start Truths International, a nonprofit consulting organization dedicated to working with other nonprofits and donors to help measure and improve the impact of small scale community development initiatives. And one of the areas that we specifically focus on is the coffee value chain. And this has all led me as well to the privileged position of teaching. So in addition to all the work that I do, with Truths International and development work in coffee farming communities. I also teach about coffee, gender, and development. And I'll be sharing with you today more on those specific topics. So this lecture today is based on a course that I teach for Kansas State University Online called Women and Globalization. And it's a course that examines globalization via a gender lens, specifically looking at how gender shapes and impacts the coffee value chain and women in that value chain. So in this particular course, we move from macro to micro and back, taking a bird's eye view and looking at big picture issues, then peeling back the layers of the complex globalized economy that we live in today, focusing on work and where women fit in this world of work and how they're impacted. We also go on in this course to examine the coffee value chain and specifically gender relations and women in the coffee value chain. So you may be wondering, for this particular lecture, why not just talk about coffee? Why do we need to look at all this big picture stuff? Well, as I tell my students, and as I'll tell you, we need to talk about the big picture stuff because in order to understand gender in the coffee value chain, we need to understand the context in which the coffee industry is situated. So what exactly is globalization? I'm sure you've heard this term. It's commonly thrown around. Well, in general, it refers to an economic, political, social, and cultural process. And some would claim that it's not necessarily such a new thing. The word itself is new, but the process describes something old. 
going back five centuries to colonialism, global trade, when the European conquistadors set out to claim new lands, new people, and set up new empires. And intricately tied to globalization is development. Well, and what is development? Well, it's a concept, a process, and a state of being, very much related to the idea of what it means to be modern. Development, though, also refers to historical processes, current processes, and what's expected in the future. So this concept of development goes all the way back to colonialism and imperialism. And it was tied up in what was called the colonizing mission in which European conquerors sought to quote unquote, develop people in other countries. If we look at this now though, we can see that this idea of development and the actual practice of what they were doing really had a lot more to do with economic and political exploitation. And of course, this also ties into coffee and the history of coffee and how it was spread around the world and how it was involved, how it was part of colonialism as a cash crop. So the point of talking all about all of this, about historical globalization, development, and colonialism's impact on the modern day is to think about how historical legacies have affected modern day, quote unquote, development. So even though we know nowadays that this colonial sort of structure for growing coffee on large plantations, exploiting labor, perhaps people being used as slaves, that shifted now and 80% of the world's coffee is grown by smallholder farmers. But where we can see a connection between the historical legacy and the modern day reality is looking specifically at the issue of poverty, for example. 50% of smallholder coffee farmers live in poverty around the world. Now, is, just the, is this something that's happened in a vacuum or is it something that we can see relating to this history of globalization development and power. And taking all these big picture concepts a step further, in talking about development, we can't leave out the sustainable development goals. These are a set of universal goals that came about in 2015 that built upon the Millennium Development Goals that go beyond measuring development according to economic indicators, which is pretty common. We tend to think about development in terms of economics. But the sustainable development goals include other issues such as health, hunger, education, peace, sustainable consumption, and production. The reason that it's important to talk about these in the whole context of coffee, globalization, and gender is because the sustainable development goals frame conversations around agendas and policies by UN member states. And they directly relate to issues facing the coffee value chain in terms of agricultural production, decent work, responsible consumption and production, climate, and gender equality. So having covered some of these bigger picture issues related to globalization, both historically and in the modern day in a more general sense, as well as development, now we're gonna dive in a little bit more into contemporary globalization and its impact on development. So contemporary globalization refers to what's been occurring since more or less the 1980s. It's a term that's been coined by Anthony Giddens that refers to the intensification of worldwide social relations which link distant localities in such a way that local happenings are shaped by events occurring many miles away and vice versa. So that's kind of a more general definition for modern globalization. What's been involved in this whole quote, quote unquote new wave of globalization? Well, it's something called neoliberal economic principles. These are at the core of globalization as we know it. Just to give a quick rundown of some of the features and some of the processes that have taken place as part of this, this has included 
a real focus and push since the 1980s on market capitalism and increasing industrialization, the removal of restrictions and more open economies, so quote unquote free trade or removal of barriers to trade. It's also involved the dominance of multinational corporations. This may seem to be something that's pretty common nowadays, but back in the 1980s, this wasn't necessarily the case. There weren't as many corporations. You were looking at a lot middle to small businesses. Not so much now. Globalization as we know it has also involved rapid changes in technology. I know it may seem hard to believe for those of you who are in your late teens or 20s, but I'm 37 and just in the process of my life, looking back to being born in 1980 and seeing the rapid changes that have taken place since then, imagine this compared to previous eras. Globalization as we know it has also involved the increasing influence of multilateral international institutions. So these are big organizations that have been able to set policy and implement policy at a global level, where before national governments held a lot more power and were able to make a lot more decisions on their own. Some of these institutions include the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund or the IMF, and the World Trade Organization or the WTO. And another key feature that's at the core of contemporary globalization and the relationship between quote unquote developed and developing countries has been structural adjustment programs. Without going into too much detail, these have basically been loans that were offered to low income countries in the 1980s, many that were struggling to get funding and credit uh, for certain programs in their country. These were loans that were offered at a reduced rate, some of which too to bail out countries that had fallen into um, large debts. But these loans contained certain policies and certain restrictions that required these countries to open their markets, to liberalize trade, and to encourage foreign direct investment. And accompanying these loans was also the stipulation that many of these countries would reduce state spending and public services. In other words, that they would reduce government spending on social services. All in all, contemporary globalization has created a much quote unquote flatter world, as Thomas Friedman uses the term, or this idea that we're all more interconnected than we've ever been before. But in addition to increasing connection, it's also created a much stronger system of global competitiveness. Regardless of how you see globalization, it's impacted you in some way. And depending on where you live in the world, it can potentially be a positive or a negative impact or both. So studies of globalization over the past 20 years have looked at different ways that globalization has been positive, but also negative. So Contemporary globalization as we know it, if we can think of it as a kind of program that's been implemented by economic superpowers, dominant economic entities, be they governments or corporations, globalization has been put forth as promising economic development, free markets, poverty reduction, higher standards of living, and increased status of women. So according to the common logic, positive economic growth as part of contemporary globalization leads to greater gender equality. We're gonna start looking specifically at issues related to gender. And the idea here is that globalization opens up more opportunities for women to participate in the labor market, which means greater economic empowerment for women. And additionally, as part of globalization, a greater number of international bodies that deal with gender equality and human rights have come about. So this is seen as a positive. On the other hand, there are academics and people who study this phenomenon of globalization that have seen it as a negative, that claim that it's brought about more inequality and uneven development. There's been an increasing gap between rich and poor around the world, both between countries and within countries. 
and that globalization has actually negatively impacted women. Now, how this has come about is with the increasing consolidation of business and corporations and more and more global supply chains that have been brought into existence. And many of these supply chains or value chains rely on labor intensive production processes that previously took place in countries like the US but that now have been relocated to poorer countries. Many of these countries have a stronger sexual division of labor or division of who does what, men versus women. And this in turn, in many cases, some see as having led to increased exploitation of women. So women have been brought into jobs that offer lower wages, that tend to be casual work versus permanent or benefit or positions with benefits, that they have less bargaining power, that yes, they have more opportunities to work, but the structure of that work is actually exploitative. Additionally, one of the negative effects that contemporary globalization is seen as having bring about is that women have to take on more unpaid labor or care work. And this is basically cooking, cleaning, household labor, taking care of children and elders. And these are uh, tasks that previously may have been covered by government provided social services, but due to structural adjustment programs, as we just talked about in the previous slide, many of these have been deteriorated and so increasingly the burden of this work has fallen upon women. And finally, scholars that discuss the negative impacts of globalization also refer to this previous point above about globalization as positive and saying there's more international bodies now dealing with this issue and that's a positive. Those who see globalization as negative may say actually the reason that these international bodies are having to deal with all of these issues is because of the negative impact of globalization on women and in general on human rights. So having covered all of these super global issues from the globalized economy, its impact on development and gender relations and specifically women, we can now turn our attention to the coffee value chain. And we can start to think about how all of these big picture issues play out within this one particular industry. In particular, the coffee value chain provides a sort of case study for thinking about and analyzing globalization. As mentioned previously, one of the key features of contemporary globalization is an increase in multinational corporations as well as global value chains. And I know that you've discussed value chains in your course, but just to provide a quick review, a value chain refers to all of the actors and activities that are involved in bringing a product from conception to design to final marketing, distribution, and consumption. So basically, within the coffee value chain, we're looking at every single actor and activity that's involved in bringing a coffee bean from a producer to cup. So some of the current issues related to globalization and development that we covered in previous slides, the ones that have really impacted the coffee value chain are related to neoliberalism. Specifically, we mentioned the increasing consolidation of corporations. In the case of coffee, this has been very, very evident in that a few corporations control coffee trading and roasting nowadays. More specifically, coffee trading is dominated by three companies and coffee roasting is dominated by four companies. We've also seen an increasing influence of multilateral international institutions. So we mentioned this before, the World Bank, the IMF, the WTO, implementing policy at a global level that usurps national government policy. And this has been particularly evident in coffee in that structural adjustment programs have very much impacted low-income countries, many of which are coffee producing countries. And additionally, in the process of dismantling what were seen as trade barriers, in 1989, the International Coffee Agreement, or the ICA, was done away with in the name of free trade. Now, 
for those of you studying coffee, and I'm, I'm assuming you've covered this in your course, this has had a huge impact on the coffee industry itself, and especially on producing countries. This has played out in statistics related to the percentage of total income within the coffee value chain that's been retained in producing versus consuming countries. So in the 1970s, with the ICNCA in place, the percentage of total income retained by producing countries was at about 20%. This shifted dramatically following the ICA and was reduced to about 13%. And in turn, what's been seen as a re result of the removal of the ICA is a drastic increase in the total income retained by consuming countries. So in 1970, pre-ICA, or with the existence of the ICA, consuming countries retained about 53% of earnings. Still not completely fair compared to 20% of producing countries, but considering that following the dismantling of the ICA, 78% of total income in the copy value chain has been retained in consuming countries. In comparison with 13% by producing countries, we can see here that there are some major inequalities that have taken place as a result of, or at least parallel to contemporary globalization. And then adding to this within the coffee value chain, there are other issues that are related to globalization and uh, the coffee value chain, specifically migration and climate change. So these global issues have impacted the coffee value chain as a whole, as well as individuals and organizations within that chain. But as discussed previously, the impacts of globalization don't necessarily affect everyone in the same way. And a particular focus for our lecture today is the impact upon women. So continuing on in this lecture, I'll do a broad sweep of the coffee value chain, looking at specific nodes or links within the chain where women are involved and analyze a bit some of the specific impacts that globalization has had on women in these particular nodes. So these include production, export, import, trade and business, and roasting consumption and retail. We'll look at some of the commonalities that women across the value chain experience and also delve a bit into specifics based on what part of the chain they're a part of. So listed here are some general overarching commonalities and many of these we covered previously in the slide that talked about globalization's impact on women. We'll see how these play out in each part of the chain. So beginning with production, there are specific roles and responsibilities that women take when it comes to producing coffee in comparison with men. So we can see some of these roles in the graphic contained here. Women tend to be more involved with field work, harvesting, and processing. But when it comes down to transporting, selling and marketing coffee, in general, the world over, those particular areas tend to be relegated to men. Of course, these roles and responsibilities vary by country and region, so it's very hard to completely generalize. So for example, in Oaxaca, Mexico, where I'm based and where I've done a lot of work with coffee, women tend to be in charge of household finances and expenses related to coffee and women are more likely to report sole control over their coffee earnings. However, in Uganda, on the other hand, women don't tend to own land, they don't tend to have ownership of the coffee crop, and men tend to control any income brought in from coffee and tend to control sales and marketing of coffee. In general, within the coffee value chain and at the level of production, women farmers tend to lack access to information, training, and education, tend to lack titles to land. For example, in Africa, 12% of women and 31% of men own land individually, so there's a disparity there. Women in general tend to lack credit, and they tend to lack productive resources when it comes to coffee production. So what this means is, for example, in the case of Oaxaca, Mexico, 
women's agricultural work tends to be more tedious, manual, and time intensive due to having less physical strength. Um, this is, could just be a biological function difference between men and women, but also because they have less access to animal power or machinery, whereas men are more likely to have animals or machinery to help out with coffee production. The FAO has released statistics showing that if women had access to productive resources at the same level as men do when it comes to agricultural production, yields could increase 20 to 30 percent, total agricultural output in developing countries could increase 2.5 to 4 percent, and we'd see a reduction in hunger between 12 to 17 percent. So some other issues specifically affecting women at production level include gender division of labor. So we've talked about this before. Who does what? What do men do and what do women do? Now, in particular, one of the key issues here relates to care work. It's generally assumed, and we can say generally the world over, that in most coffee farming communities, women are the ones who are expected to do care work or household labor. In Uganda, for example, women will work an average of 15 hours a day during the coffee harvest. So that includes the harvest and care work, whereas men tend to work about eight hours, pure harvest. So we see a major disparity there as well. Another issue facing many women coffee producers at origin is outward migration. So we mentioned this earlier as a general issue affecting the coffee value chain. Now how this affects women in particular is that as more men are migrating, uh, having a lot to do too with low coffee prices in many countries, women are having to fill their roles. And this means that they're taking on more and more responsibilities. So despite increasing migration and the need for women to take on different roles in the home, the field, and potentially in cooperatives and organizations of small scale farmers, despite this, in general, the world over, there tends to be less female members of these sorts of organizations and even less women who are in leadership roles. Now, part of this ties back to time constraints related to the division of labor. So what's known as time poverty or the triple burden, that women are already dealing for the most part with household labor and care work in addition to field work related to coffee to then have to take on a leadership role and active participation in a co cooperative or an organization is a triple burden. It's something that many women simply don't do. And at the same time, there are certain cultural norms in many countries and regions that prohibit women from being active and cooperative or taking leadership roles. And many times women also have less mobility. So these are all issues that affect women's participation in organizational governance of smallholder farmer groups. And finally, a particular issue that tends to affect women more than men at the level of production, sadly, is sexual violence. So moving along the chain to export, import, trade, and business, increasingly there's not as much information on how women are impacted in particular in this particular note of the coffee value chain. While there is ample research and ample information on women at production level, as we move forward, there is not as much. But there are some similarities, again, relating to general global issues and general global trends. So within this particular note of the, train, of the, of the chain, there is again a marked gender division of labor and a lack of women represented at this level. So for example, in the African coffee sector, women do 70% of field work and harvesting, but are only engaged in about 10% of in-country and international trade. So they're not represented at this level of the chain as they are at production level. Additionally, this filters to affect leadership uh, by women at cooperative and business levels. Again, echoing what we saw at production. Now, why is this? Is this simply discrimination? Well, in many cases, it could be considered that or sexism. 
but it also is related to women's lack of knowledge about quality control and international standards, lack of access to resources and opportunities, as well as discriminatory legal and cultural practices. So what we talked about previously in terms of social and cultural norms that limit women's participation in certain realms. So we're seeing a lot of similarities here between, in general, women at production, as well as women at export, import, trade, and business. So moving on to the final node of the copy value chain that we'll be looking at today, consumption, roasting, and retail. Again, we see many similarities here to other nodes that we just talked about. In particular, the professionalization of the coffee retail industry within the past few years has led to what many would consider a masculinization of the workforce. What does this mean exactly? Well, a specialty coffee has grown. Uh, it now has a 50% value share in a $30 billion industry. Uh, and this has happened within the past 20 to 30 years. Coffee making and selling has been seen as uh, a more skilled job. So whereas previously being a barista, for example, wasn't really considered much of a career, it, that has shifted dramatically within just the past few years. And with this increase in skill is an increase in prestige, an increase in wages in many cases, but then simultaneously, this tends to be concentrated around men and less women get, keep, and advance within this field. So why exactly is this? Well, many would point to the shift of coffee consumption from public to private to public spheres. So beginning in the 17th and 18th centuries, European coffee houses were male only spaces. And that changed in the 20th century. Coffee became much more of a privately consumed product. So you consumed it at home, typically prepared by who makes food in the house, typically women. And then in, in turn, that's shifted again in the late 20th century as coffee has once again become a public space beverage. Think of the explosion of Starbucks and other specialty coffee retail uh, stores and coffee shops. So within this particular area of the value chain, we do see, again, a gender division of labor. And we also see a major pay gap between male and female professionals in this particular area. There are also gendered expectations and social norms that relate to this kind of work. So we think about public skilled work. We tend to think of technical proficiency, which tends to be associated with men, versus private or service work, i.e. E, I. E. hospitality, which tends to be considered very feminized or relating to women. So what does all this mean? Well, in general, while there are both men and women working in this area, roasting, for example, tends to be dominated by men. And at least within retail, there is much more of a balance, but you don't see as many women in leadership positions or higher paid positions. So again, we're seeing similar issues affect at, at production, at export and trade in this part of the so chain. Across the value chain, we're seeing that there are definite issues in terms of gender equity and empowerment. And it goes without saying, why is it important to address this? Well, obviously, women's social and economic marginalization affects income, health, nutrition and education of women themselves and their families. This can be said across the whole value chain, regardless of what level a woman is at. And essentially, it's absolutely imperative that gender inequalities be addressed in order to improve human development and well-being. This is necessary for sustainable development. And in this case, I'm talking about sustainable development, not just in terms of the sustainable development goals that we talked about, but on a more broad sense, if we think about a whole of society and the general future of humanity. So listed here are some terms that guide our discussion about ways to move forward when we think about gender equity and empowerment. I wanna highlight that gender equity is the idea of fairness 
It's a means for achieving gender equality. So it takes into account the different needs of men and women. It includes measures to compensate for imbalances between the sexes, most often addressing disadvantages faced by women. So we've heard about some of those disadvantages at different nodes in the coffee value chain. Well, so what are some of the actual projects and actions that can be taken or an, and are being taken to address these? So there are different ways of thinking about macro to micro level change. We'll start with policy. So this is at a more global level. And this is via organizations, international governing bodies like the UN that have created policies and measures meant to promote gender equality, uh, such as the Commission on Status of Women, Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Policies that are meant to be implemented by UN uh, subscribing bodies and governments. Additionally, organizations like the Food and Agriculture Organization have also created their own sections and their own policies related to gender equity and rural employment. Again, we're talking top, top level, uh, top down initiatives here. And within the coffee industry, though, there's also organizations like the International Coffee Organization that have started mainstreaming gender or creating a specific focus on gender within the work that they do and considering women and gender in their projects. So inclusion of gender analysis, for example. So that's top-down policy. I mean, the question is though, really, do people apply this? Do people listen? It's hard to say, but there's also actions that are being taken, such as projects. Some of these are public-private partnerships. So organizations like the IFC and the World Bank, which is, you know, very large global organizations, they're partnering with multinational corporations and organizations on projects to integrate women more into the coffee. More specifically, some of these initiatives are looking at developing national policies that include women working with trade institutions, chambers of commerce, as well as governments to ensure that there are national export policies, for example, that include women. And also asking governments to mainstream gender issues in trade, uh, encouraging governments, for example, to offer incentives, reduction of tariffs, to sectors with high female employment levels, offering tax in incentives to, for exports from women-owned businesses. Um, but additionally, these organizations are also looking at influencing international organizations and in aid, so tying to a degree uh, foreign aid to gender equity outcomes. So basically saying, we'll give you aid if you work on meeting specific gender equity goals and you're implementing policies and implementing programs to make that happen. Uh, additionally, as mentioned, public-private partnerships, uh, many multinational corporations now are implementing what's called supplier diversity programs in which they're creating policies within their own companies to support and source from women. And then Within the coffee value chain, there are also a number of initiatives that we can call market-based strategies. So these are more focused on ways of addressing inequalities impacting women at production level, but then additionally within the companies and the organizations that are purchasing and working with producer groups. So one in particular to bring up here is the Coffee Quality Institute's Partnership for Gender Equity. This is a unique market-based strategy that uh, has been going on for a number of years. They've been doing a lot of research on this and they've come up with eight essential steps to promote gender equity at origin. So again, the focus here is mostly on production. Um, this involves increasing women's participation in training programs, making sure programs are gender sensitive. So again, this addresses the lack of knowledge and skills that many women uh, face uh, and also the fact that uh, many programs are not necessarily designed for them. Uh, it also proposes investing in programs to reduce time pressures on women, going back to the gender division of labor, care work, uh, the expectation that women do household work, and because of that are oftentimes unable to participate in 
cooperative or organizational activities and leadership. Also, improving women's access to credit and assets. So this goes back to the fact of women not owning land, not having access to credit or productive resources that impacts in turn the work that they do. Again, uh, achieving greater gender balance in leadership positions, supporting joint decision-making and ownership of income and resources at the household level. So this is moving into something that could be a little bit more sensitive, a little more culturally specific, but looking at ways that men and women working together in the household um, have more shared ownership, decision-making power. And then for coffee buyers and organizations that purchase coffee, there's a proposed uh, uh, suggestion to source and market coffee from women producers and coffee pr produced under conditions of gender equity. Additionally, um, there's a more general recommendation to develop a list of gender equity principles for coffee, something that would require quite a bit of time and agreement to come up with. And then finally, uh, the Coffee Quality Institute's Partnership for Gender Equity proposes building understanding through further research and measurement, understanding that this is a continually evolving field and uh, there's much more research to be done on ways that gender equity can be encouraged within the coffee value chain. Now, in addition to work like the Coffee Quality Institute's Partner for, Partnership for Gender Equity, there are other market-based strategies uh, that seek to promote gender equity in some way. There are certifications like fair trade. So fair trade certification uh, is all about creating more transparency within the supply chain between producers and consumers in different products, coffee being one of the first and one of the most important. Uh, fair trade is often considered to be a de facto certification that ensures gender equity, that promotes gender equity. But the research on this uh, has actually been quite mixed. While gender equity is one of the principles of fair trade and social premiums that go back to producers are expected to be uh, put in to these different principles and different projects at origin, Again, the results are mixed uh, in terms of how effective fair trade is in generating gender equity. Really, a lot of it depends on the organization itself, their, the work that they're doing, um, and their focus on gender equity, as we talked about before, at origin, at production level, there is generally a lack of women participating as members of cooperatives and as, as smallholder farmer organizations, especially at leadership positions. So we can, in a way, think about how that might affect fair trade premiums, where they're focused, what sort of priorities. Um, so again, it's not just a de facto guarantee of gender equity. Additionally, uh, market-based strategies that have risen in the past few years seeking to promote gender equity inc include women's coffee brands. One of the more famous one is Cafe Feminino, which involves sourcing exclusive, exclusively from women, so women coffee producers, and seeking to raise the profile of their product and the work that they do, and uh, seeking to provide them income and recognition for the work that they do. Now, going a bit deeper into this though, uh, there are other initiatives that have looked at women's coffee brands and that have sought to go, what some would say is a step further than just simply sourcing from women, putting a woman's face on a package of coffee and saying, this is gender equity coffee. Um, some of these initiatives that I've had the privilege of working with include Femme Cafe in Mexico, and then an organization called Etico in Nicaragua that specifically focus on recognizing and remunerating women's unpaid work. <clears throat> so the care work that we've been talking about. <clears throat> these, these particular organizations seek to look at deeper structures of gender inequity in communities and at the household level to say, it's not so much about just saying a woman produced this, but it's about looking at the different gender relations, who does what in the household, and how is it possible to put social premiums from these projects back into the community, into remunerating women for unpaid labor, 
and seeking to shift this gender division of labor, labor at the household level. Of course, this can be a very complicated and messy thing, especially when you're thinking about cultural mores, cultural norms, and, not, and wanting to be uh, sensitive to that. In the particular case of Femme Cafe, at least in my experience, I've had the privilege of interviewing them for a gender analysis with the Coffee Quality Institute. And it was very interesting to visit this very small cooperative and meet the women and men of the cooperative who together have decided to pursue this initiative. Of men indicating that they understand their role in gender equity and working towards it. Oftentimes, just as a generalization, I would say in the world of gender and development, there tends to be a focus on women and saying, okay, what programs can we do for women to create more equity? How can we involve women? But oftentimes men are either overlooked or left out or they're simply not included. And at times that can be detrimental because if one of the main issues at the core of inequality at the household level, for example, is care work and that women are expected to do the majority of it, well, how do you change that? Ultimately, men would have to be involved in that conversation to see what sort of um, role might they play in shifting expectations. How do you do that? And really, at the end of the day, this comes down to individual conversations, individual work at a very basic level but incredibly important as we're looking at ways of shifting gender equity from the top down, but also from the ground up in the coffee value chain. We've covered a lot of information here and talked about bigger picture processes and how they impact people on the ground at different levels of the coffee value chain and what sort of efforts and what sort of solutions might exist to addressing gender equity in the coffee value chain. As you can see, it's not simple at all. Uh, we were looking at different nodes of the value chain and specific issues that are uh, affecting women and gender relations and men at those specific parts of the value chain with some commonalities among them. But it may feel like a big ball of wax or a big ball of string. It's like, how on earth do you even begin to promote gender equity, to work towards it, and ultimately working towards gender equality when there's so many moving parts, so many actors, so many activities, and so many global forces that are, are impacting this work. Well, I certainly don't have the solution myself. And in fact, in working within this area, studying in this area, and teaching with this, within this area, what I end up having with these sorts of presentations and lectures is actually more questions. So for example, we've covered some ideas for policy and how we can implement gender equity from the top down on a very global level and apply that specifically to the coffee value chain. But the question remains, is policy actually being applied? Is it being enforced? What sort of repercussions are there if a nation doesn't implement a UN sanctioned uh, gender equity policy? And at the same time, we can trickle that see that trickle down to the organizational or individual level. What sort of impact does this have on a coffee company? What sort of imperative or necessity do they have to implement gender equity principles? What about the cooperative level, or the production level, at the individual household level? Does policy really have an effect? And then additionally, when we talked about the different initiatives and projects, do those really have meaningful outcomes? How are how is impact of these projects being measured? Is it simply number of women participating, number of women in a cooperative, number of women in leadership positions? Should we be going a step further to perhaps look about look at real participation or a deeper outcome, a deeper impact? As in, are they participating actively? Are there changes being made? Or is it simply about quotas? So again, thinking very critically about these different initiatives. Also, in some of my work researching this and teaching, one thing that I found that has struck me, there's a lot of talk within the coffee value chain about gender equity. So there's initiatives out there, the Coffee Quality Institute Partnership for Gender Equity, other projects and programs. 
the SCA has put out a white paper discussing ways that gender equity can be implemented at origin. But what I find may perhaps be missing from this conversation is a bit more of self-reflection from consumption, retail, roasting, export trade and business side of the coffee value chain or the nodes of the coffee value chain. There's a lot of focus on production and saying, here's what producers at origin and organizations at origin should be doing to promote gender equity. But is there really a lot of reflection at those other nodes of the chain, which tend to be based in consuming countries? Is there a reflection on, well, what are we doing for this? What is my company doing to address gender inequity within my own company? And some of the issues that were raised earlier in this presentation. At times, and this is pretty common in the development industry and in development work, there can seem to be a very patronizing, paternalizing perspective from the developed world towards the developing. And then additionally, we didn't have time within this particular lecture to get into this, but we're talking about gender and we're focusing on women. And we're doing that to be very deliberate and very specific to look at these issues. But there are other issues within the coffee value chain that are related. Diversity, intersectionality, or this idea of intersecting inequalities, race, class, ability. These are issues that come into play in the coffee value chain that intersect and interact with gender. So these are also areas for further research as we're talking about equity in the coffee value chain. Additionally, it's important to examine the connection between globalization development and masculinities, or this idea of what it means to be a man, which of course varies around the world. But basically, globalization has affected gender relations and has affected men and has affected the idea of masculinity. And this is something that requires further exploration. We tend to often, as I've said, focus on women when we talk about gender. But what about men? What role do men play and what role can they take on to support and promote gender equity, not just within the coffee value chain, but in general? And finally, my last question related to all this information that we've covered, what about you? And so what does this mean to you as a student, as someone who will be a professional someday, as a consumer? You're part of this globalization, development, this all impacts you and it affects you. You're part of the system. So what role can you play in promoting greater gender equity and greater justice within the coffee value chain?